live in a democracy where the outside foreign power determines who my leaders are. And that's going to happen more and more, not just in the United States, but you've had experiences here in Germany, experiences across Europe. So let's come on, let's, let's face up to the reality that if we don't protect our democracy, we're slowly but steadily surrendering it and losing control of it. You know what, I, politics is, is a context for it. I mean, people say all, all sorts of things, because they certainly have said all sorts of things about me. I'll support the nominee of our party because I think that uh, 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 you know our current president is a clear and present danger to democracy and uh, to our future. Blather from Hillary Clinton. She is shameless, utterly shameless. She'll say anything. The fact that Democrats think that she would have been some great choice for the presidency, that she would have been this, this ethical paragon, this virtuous leader, is laughable. She could not be more corrupt. And, you know, it, it couldn't be more obvious that there was an effort to suppress what we could all see, which was that the Clinton Foundation was a massive slush fund created for the sole purpose of enriching and empowering the Clintons while pretending to do charitable work. You haven't heard a lot about the Clinton Foundation lately, have you? Those donations all dried up real fast when Hillary wasn't going to be president anymore. That's so weird, isn't it? Hmm. And it's not like, oh no, it is true that I was at, C- I was at CNN and I was saying to people uh, on air, we all know the Clinton Foundation is like a fake charity, right? And that the donations, we'll see where they are after the election. And of course, I was right. But they were, CNN, oh, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But she calls the president a, for, she, she repeats the talking points about Russia, which is just now, that is the hallmark of a, of a, a reckless, stupid, or dishonest person, or, or all of the above. Uh, Russia is not picking our leaders. No one really thinks Russia is picking our leaders. This is, this is ridiculous. And if you look back in history, the KGB was involved in paying for newspapers, involved in information operations against the United States, had high level, did have high level penetrations of the United States government, including Alger Hiss, who was a Harvard trained lawyer that the establishment in this country flocked around. I mean, they they circled the wagons to defend Alger Hiss and Whitaker Chambers, as he writes about beautifully in the book Witness, which I recommend to all of you. Whitaker Chambers is like, this guy is a, is a Soviet spy. And he works at a senior level in the United States government. He's a Soviet spy. Because the left has always had a little bit of the, uh, they've always had this special fondness and familiarity with totalitarians and communists. They always have had this. Because their mentality, their mindset is that if the government only had more power, it would make the problems go away. And they're the smart, good people. So if you take the smart, good people and you put them in power, then all of a sudden everything gets better. Whereas conservatives, people like me and those of you listening who are conservative, which is pretty much all of you, uh, we think, no, no, no. We want individual rights, individual liberty to be protected under law. And we want there to be clear restraints on what the government can do because there also are areas the government should not do things. It's not even just that we'd, we don't like the idea. There would be negative consequences from government action. And this is the constant struggle that we have day in and day out in our, in our politics. But for Hillary Clinton to say the Russia stuff, oh, she's, she's just atrocious. She's atrocious. And we all know it. And they pretend that she, well, now they don't really care anymore, but they, for, for years... We're told how smart and how capable and how great she is. The worst. I mean, she is the worst. Okay, no, I got to retract that. Sanders is probably even worse. <laughs> so we've, we've gone from bad to worse, or the worst with Hillary Clinton, saying that Trump is a clear and present danger to our democracy and our future. You know, I'm focusing in so much today on Sanders. I want to talk about some of the other Democrat candidates. We have this uh, debate tonight in South Carolina, but... The crazy has spread far and wide in the Democratic Party. This is not limited to one candidate or one candidate's supporters. Uh, Tom Steyer, he is a billionaire, which just goes to show you that if you're really lucky, (laughs) you're in the right place at the right time, you too, even if you have no judgment, no wisdom whatsoever, and really no self-awareness, you too can be a a billionaire, I suppose. Uh, this is what a voter, a Democrat, obviously, in South Carolina said to Tom Steyer and his response. I just I want to give you more evidence that 
The Democratic Party has has spun off of the planet and they're living in crazy town now. Play a seven. Um, I'm 27 years old and I still have buying a house, getting married and having kids ahead of me. What do you say to people my age and those who are younger who are frankly terrified of what climbing, climate change will do to this planet and our futures? So Natalie, thank you for asking that question. Look, I am the only person running for president who will say that climate is his or her number one priority. The only one, go ask them, the only one. And I've said that I will declare, just so you know, Natalie, a state of emergency on climate on the first day of my presidency. And I will use the executive emergency powers of the presidency to tell companies how they can generate electricity, what kind of cars they can build on what schedule, what kind of buildings we're going to have, how we're going to use our public lands, how the government, which is the biggest buyer of fossil fuels in the world, is going to move to clean energy. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot to unpack there. Let's start with a voter, a 27-year-old woman saying she is terrified of climate change. Be terrified of, you know, making the wrong life choices. Be terrified of pandemic disease. Be terrified of the possibility of a major war with China. I mean, there are things to really be concerned about. To be terrified of climate change is to surrender to a mental illness. Climate change is not coming for us. It's not going to destroy us. It's not going to kill us. This is insane. This really is not reasonable. It's not rational at all. And I, mean, I, I think that you know, they, they have to assume that I'm, I'm somehow the crazy one because I don't think the world is going to end. This is what American politics has done to people. The guy who sits around saying, no, no, the human race will not go extinct unless we destroy essentially all the major economic progress we've made in the last hundred years or so. The human race will not go extinct if we don't just give back all of those gains and productivity and, and life, expe- uh, life expectancy and health and you know, everything. I'm the crazy one. Because I say that that's not going to happen. So I, I, feel almost, I feel badly, but I also uh, feel very concerned when I hear things like this because there are things to worry about and climate change is not one of them. And for a young woman to say she's terrified of climate change, what exactly is she terrified of? Somebody should ask her. I mean, I feel like I should sit down and we could do a, you know, like a Sigmund Freud, like, so tell me all of your secrets and your thoughts. What are you terrified of? Tell me about your parents. You know, like, this is... This is where you'd have to get into some buck pretending to be a shrink, some psychotherapy. You're terrified of a thing that's not going to hurt you in any way, shape, or form. Of the global temperature changing. That's what worries you so much. But this is like people that used to worry that there was going to be, um, you know, we're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of food. That was a, a belief you know, you read Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. You know, we're going to reach a certain population growth, and then we're going to have huge contractions. Not everyone's going to die, but huge contractions because we won't be able to sustain it. And now the biggest problem we have globally is people eat too many calories. That's a much bigger concern than people not getting enough calories globally. So, okay. Um, she's terrified of climate change, which is bizarre. But then the, the even more concerning part of this, other than that, well, that poor woman's emotional instability, is that uh, Tom Steyer is just saying that he's going to, if he becomes president, which I know is never going to happen, but I'm just we're exploring a mentality here that's not just Biden. I'm sorry, not just Bernie, although Biden's got his own problems. Uh, the mentality is that once you become president, you just start doing things. Obama did this, and the media was largely silent about it or encouraged it. You know, Obama's mantra became, Congress won't do what I want, so I'm just going to do it myself as president with an executive order and, and see if the courts will will stop me. And the courts did a number of times and overturned him for doing unconstitutional things. That was the reality of the Obama administration. But you never heard the same thing, though, with Trump is waging war on journalists. Meanwhile, Obama took real action against journalists and used the Espionage Act more than every other president before him combined. But, you know, the journalists wrote like one or two editorials. They're like, this is a concerning situation. They say that Trump is endangering journalists' lives. But, oh, this is a concerning situation with Obama with actual trying to prosecute people as co-conspirators under the Espionage Act who are journalists. Uh, journalists are frauds. I mean, I really, it's funny. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in this media profession. I'm not a journalist. 
And I, my contempt for mainstream journalists grows every day. Every day, I feel like I'm more fed up with what a bunch of just total jokes and jerks they are. Very few of them provide any real value. They all, they all just parrot each other, and they're all just struggling to get more attention for their boring repetition of the talking points of the Democrat Party and the American left. That, that's what they're doing all the time. I mean, the ones who are valuable, the ones who are like, here's the traffic, here's the weather. Hey, here's a video of some ducks that were saved at the pond by the fire department. Yay. Like, that's, you know, okay. That's providing people with something. The ones that just carry the water of the Democratic Party all the time, we don't need that. Just go, just go, go to the DNC website. Uh, but Bern- but uh, Steyer here saying that he wants to use I- executive power to con- I mean, basically to control everything. What kind of cars they can build, what kind of buildings we're going to have, how we generate electricity. So when I say things to you like climate change is an excuse for, for socialist authoritarians to enact policies to control every aspect of your life, that's not ju- I'm, I'm not coming up with that out of thin air. That is what they're doing. That is the idea. That is the approach. So you end up, you end up asking yourself, okay, um, these people are nuts. And if they're in charge, they're going to just do things. Forget about the Congress. They're just going to do things based on their crazy ideas. This is broader in the Democratic Party. This is not just a problem of Bernie Sanders. That's what I wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page about. And then there's Biden. Oh, Joe Biden. He's probably going to win in South Carolina. And then the Biden, the Bidenistas out there in the media will say, see, he is the front runner. Mm, no. And I, we start to get it into this place where I don't want to be mean about Joe Biden's condition, um, but health and mental faculties are a legitimate area of discussion for the person who wants to be the president of the United States. And this is, uh, this is not a, a one-off. I mean, this is becoming increasingly the, the expectation around Joe Biden is that he's going to have these, what you would, I think, call a senior moment. Um, and this is an example of that. Here's Joe Biden on the stump doing what he does. Play clip five. And you're the ones that sent Barack Obama the presidency. And I have a simple proposition here. I'm here to ask you for your help. Where I come from, you don't get far unless you ask. My name's Joe Biden. I'm a Democratic candidate for the United States Senate. Look me over. If you like what you see, help out. If not, vote for the other guy. Give me a look, though, okay? Running for Senate, and if you don't like me, vote for the other Biden. That was in one sentence. I I mean, if it were one of those things and he corrected it right away, I mean, I misspeak. I do extemporaneous radio for four hours a day now. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to say things incorrectly. But if I ever said, you know, my name is Bob Sexton, I promise you I would change that. I would edit that. I wouldn't say it and then go, yeah, it's good to be Bob. You know, Bob's hanging out. No, you would catch that unless something else is going on. And it wasn't one little slip. It was he's running for president. He's not running for Senate. And there's no other Biden in the race. And he just kind of went on with it. But then again, there's a part of me that feels like maybe the greatest service the Democratic Party, the the Democrat media can do right now is to save the Democratic Party from a Bernie Sanders nomination. I mean, maybe they're much more uh, cynical about this than I had I had really given them credit for or or anticipated. I think that's also possible that they recognize what a disaster Bernie Sanders would be for the party. And so perhaps some of them somewhere in their minds feel like if they have to prop Biden up some more, then that's what they're going to do. That's the best thing they can do for the party. We'll see about Bloomberg. There was a funny meme making the rounds today. Well, I'm sorry, it wasn't a meme. It wasn't a meme. Pardon me. It was a, I'm Joe Biden. I'm running for president. Uh, it was a, a screenshot of the, Los, of the Los Angeles Times, one of the home pages in the Los Angeles Times for one of their sections. And the thing, it looked like the Bloomberg 2020 website. I mean, just Bloomberg ads all over it. I, I don't think it was Photoshopped. I can't, I can't tell you right off the bat, but it certainly seemed like it would be real. I mean, Bloomberg is just blanketing coverage everywhere. I think that one of the, one of the nice side effects of a Bloomberg, uh, the Bloomberg run for president 
is that he is really trying to play. It's almost like he's setting this up as an experiment. Can you buy the presidency? And when he is not successful in doing so, when people on the left, because they always Democrats always pretend like big money is just a Republican thing. And they say, we want money out of politics and you can't buy, you know, he's trying to buy this office or that office. We can say, no, no, Bloomberg tried to buy it and you can't just do that. The candidate still matters. If you have effectively unlimited funds, you still can't buy the presidency. But think about this. We are in a situation where somebody who is worth $50 billion is spending billions of dollars on a presidential candidacy. And there are still journalists out there, Hillary Clinton will say it too, many of, many of the Democrats, that Russia is interfering in the election and maybe Russia is going to cost uh, one side or the other, will we'll make Trump win. If that's what they're really saying. Even with the billions of dollars being spent by Americans on an American presidential election, if the Russians were able to sway this election outcome, we should just quit tomorrow. We should stop having elections because we'll never be able to have a free and fair election again. This is lunacy. This is utter lunacy. And David, one of the things that's so interesting and I think sinister about this stuff is that it really does have the impact of trying to increase cynicism and apathy, that that's part of its goal, to sort of muddy the waters. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about your insights into that. Well, it has, it has an effect also on people's affirmative ideas. One of the things mm -hmm. that Donald Trump tried to spend, spread in 2016 was the idea that Hillary Clinton was somehow physically incapable of managing the presidency. I mean, it's aud audacious. Donald Trump was the oldest. Uh, president ever, one of the fattest presidents ever, the least physically capable president since uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in a wheelchair. I mean, he can't pick up a ball, never mind throw it. Um, but he was able to put into the minds of tens of millions of people the idea that Hillary Clinton, who's a very vigorous woman in good health, was somehow too sick to be president. Thanks, Never Trump, for more stupidity. David Frum over there, who runs away from it. He actually does have some correct positions on things like immigration, immigration where he's thought about it a little bit. But uh, Trump is one of the fattest presidents ever. I think it's interesting. I mean, we're going to start talking about that now, huh? Um, Hillary Clinton flopped into the back of a van on video right before the election. I think, and, and they pretended initially like there was nothing going on. She just stumbled. No, she flopped into the back of a van, all right? You're allowed to wonder what's going on there. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't some huge conspiracy from Trump. But as you see here, n never Trump, they're so dug in, in in their hatred for this guy because they feel like they've bet their careers, they've bet their paychecks or, or you know, their, their fame and their importance. Their ego is so tied into anti-Trumpism that they can't even see straight anymore. I was wondering, do you think justice was served in the Harvey Weinstein case? So I was never a fan of Harvey Weinstein, as you know. In fact, he said he was going to work hard to defeat me in the election. How did that work out, by the way? I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, he, uh, he was a person I didn't like, never liked. Uh, I don't know too much about the case between traveling and, and being at meetings almost every hour of the day, every minute of the day. I haven't been able to really see too much of it. But I was just not a fan of his. I, I knew him a little bit, not very well. I knew him because he was in New York. Uh, not, not a person that I like. I will say the, the people that liked him were the Democrats. Uh, Michelle Obama loved him, loved him. Hillary Clinton loved him. And he uh, gave tremendous money to the Democrats. And I guess my question is, will the Democrats be asking for that money back? Not going to hear that from a lot of the mainstream outlets right now that, that are celebrating the Weinstein verdict as a huge uh, win for women. Um, which I, I think there's, there's, some, there's some truth to that, but there's also some concerning follow-on uh, legal implications, I believe. And I don't know, no one really seems to want to talk about this right now, and I'll get into that part of it in a second. Uh, but journalists are running around patting themselves on the back for the Weinstein verdict, saying, see, journalism still is important. No, no, journalists covered up for this guy and did his bidding for decades. And then when he got a little old and a little less powerful, a little less useful, 
Then all of a sudden it was time to write the big expose, the Ronan Farrow piece. But I, I can't help but remember that Ronan Farrow, who I think won a Pulitzer for this and became the celebrated guy, I still remember he had the worst, I mean, it really was all time, the worst cable news commentary show ever put on the air in my lifetime. The worst. I mean, I think Alec Baldwin's show was better. Ronan Farrow would sort of sit there and, yes, I'm going to do an interview now. And uh, uh, did I tell you, I worked at the State Department for like three months and uh, it was really important. And I'm a Rhodes Scholar. And, uh, you know, it was just horrible. And then he came out and he wrote this piece and he took some heat and he, he was willing to take the risk here. But he had the goods on Weinstein. He knew he did. I mean, the fact that NBC didn't want to run with it initially is an interesting part of the story, but he knew he had him. There was no, there was no like, wiggling out when you had all these people on the record and everything else. I give him credit. You know, he did, he did publish a story at first, but I also can't forget that that credibility in the Me Too movement that Ronan Farrow built by going after Harvey Weinstein was then weaponized for political purposes during the Kavanaugh hearing with that just appallingly flimsy and uh, obviously false story about Deborah Ramirez at Yale that he went with, where he, you know, the people that did know about it or did, did you know, know about her didn't believe that it had happened. And I mean, it just, you go back into it and they just were, they were like, Ronan, we need you here. It's about Roe v. Wade. You got to do what you got to do. Step in there and take down Kavanaugh. So I remember that. I'm not going to forget that. So as far as I'm concerned, he's just another hack. He threw away his credibility with that. He didn't have to do that. I think it was with Jane, Jane Mayer, too. I mean, they just they thought they had an opportunity to take down Kavanaugh, and it was a hit. It was a dirty political hit. It was a lie. I'm sorry. You don't take a week to get counseling on your memories to remember if some guy in college hit you in the face with his genitalia. You, you don't, it, it doesn't take it. And if you're so traumatized by it, it wouldn't take you a week to remember this, which is what happened with Deborah Ramirez. I mean, the whole thing was ridiculous. But, you know, it's like all these other stories that came out. Julie Swetnick, you know, the gang rape crews and everything. This was, it was all just everything you can. It was really the weaponization of gender against Kavanaugh. That was what was going on. Um, and thank God it was close. But thank God Kavanaugh was able to withstand it. And, and the United States Senate did do the right thing. I mean, you got to remember, at least the Republicans did. So, okay, now we look at what Trump is saying here about Weinstein. Weinstein wasn't just a guy who was friends with Democrats. Weinstein was close to the most powerful Democrats in the country, which he used and leveraged in order to frighten women and any, anyone who would speak about what he was doing to women into silence. So that's something that should get more attention, should get looked at more. I mean, here is, for example, remember, there were stories. Everybody knew the stories about Harvey Weinstein being a guy who was very aggressive with women, very difficult to do. I actually just spoke to somebody recently who had done business with him back when he was a, a concert promoter. That's how he got started out as a concert promoter. And then he moved into doing the Hollywood studio stuff and just said he was imp impossible to deal with, uh, a, a nasty, dishonest guy. So Democrats love him. Powerful, rich, influential in the culture, but a nasty, amoral, predatory, left-wing lib. Hey, that fits right into the Democrat. You know, the Democrats think that's all great. Um, and I mean, here's, for example, when Trump said, Trump said that uh, Harvey Weinstein was liked by these different very powerful figures. Here's Michelle Obama talking about Harvey Weinstein. Play clip three. I want to start by thanking Harvey Weinstein for organizing this amazing day. <laughs> This is possible because of Harvey. Uh, he is a wonderful human being, a good friend, and uh, just a powerhouse. And the fact that he and his team took the time to make this happen for all of you should say something not about me or about this place, but about you. All right? Everybody, we are here because of you. A wonderful human being. And this was just, I don't know, probably this was during the Obama presidency. So just a few years ago that that soundbite was, uh, we, we pulled that soundbite and um, if you believe the all of the women who testified against Harvey Weinstein he's been raping women since the 90s but, uh, but here you have probably the single most 
popular Democrat figure in the United States. It's always kind of it's Oprah or Michelle Obama. You know, there's only a few people that are as as universally beloved in all the polling and everything else uh, saying that he's a wonderful human being. Do you think anyone in the power structure will be held to account for this? Journalists didn't want to cover this story, and now they pat themselves on the back. Journalists didn't want to cover Epstein, who was also connected to all of these very powerful Democrats. Democrats are the ones that Epstein was. They focus so much on Prince Andrew because he's at least external to American politics. The media is, oh, look at the Prince Andrew situation. Uh, Epstein spent a lot of time with Bill Clinton, spent a lot of time with some other prominent Democrats. They didn't want to touch that. Um, the, look, I, I understand that the pressures that come up in the media business. It's very uncertain. It's very unfair. Uh, I just have a problem with people pretending to be brave when they're actually just uh, sniveling cowards. And most journalists on these issues have been uh, sniveling cowards. There's, there's no question about that. Now I go to the why. Okay, yeah, Harvey Weinstein. Do I, do I think that he... Um, has forced himself on women based on the testimony of, yeah, I do. I think he has. I think he's, uh, I think he has sexually assaulted women. I do believe that. But here's what I do have a problem with, and I think the jury had a bit of a problem with this too, because they did not go for the highest counts of predatory sexual assault. Now, we don't know exactly why that is, but it now, there's now been at a very high pro, in a, the highest profile case you could really think of for this kind of issue. There has been a standard set whereby a woman can uh, can have an interest in having a sexual relationship with a man and can claim that there was a an attack, a felonious rape occurred, and then after that felony, after that criminal act that could send that man to prison for 25 years, as we see now, at least that's what it is in New York, after committing a crime that could send you to prison for 25 years, that woman could, of her own volition, not married to him, doesn't live with him, not, you know, in fear of her life or physical abuse constantly, that woman can then continue a long-term, ongoing, not just relationship, sexual relationship with that man by her own choice. And then at a later date say, but, but that one time, um, he raped me, so he should go to prison for the rest of his life. Uh, this, uh, I'm just telling you, and maybe you believe in this case, that is exactly what happened, and, and uh, okay, may, maybe that is exactly what happened in this case. This is a precedent now, though, the same way that I knew that Ronan Farrow, after all the accolades about breaking the Me Too story, just give it time, he's going to go after a big Republican. It was very obvious. They were going to use this after, to go after, and they used it in the biggest, the biggest form they could. They took the biggest shot they had against Kavanaugh. And he was a part of that. You will now see this, this uh, you know, story of a case will return where a woman will claim that a very powerful man that she had a long-term sexual relationship with at some point during that relationship forced himself upon her or you know, she felt physically violated. And even though after that she's all, I, you know, I love you, which is what they were saying to Harvey. Two of the women were saying, to her, I, I love you, Harvey Weinstein, they would say. Please spend more time with me. Please have sex with me again. There will be cases now where, going forward, a woman will have that same kind of ongoing emotional and sexual relationship with a man, but all of a sudden, she will decide that, no, there was, I was actually raped, and I wanted to press charges, and, I want, and this person should be destroyed by the criminal justice system for what they did to me. Now, if they did actually force themselves on her, and you know, rape is a serious crime, and it's a felony, and that should be the case, as we know, there are, false race, uh, there are false rape accusations that occur. This does happen. And now this makes it much more uh, probable in my mind that you'll have an even more sort of gray area accusation down the line. I'm not talking about Harvey Weinstein. I'm talking about the precedent this sets now where, I don't know, what if, what if a woman feels like she is uh, scorned by an individual? What if a woman feels like, you know, oh, he went out and had an affair with the maid? Um, you know, I, I'm going to say that 10 years ago, that one time when we were both a little drunk and he thought it was all fun that he actually raped me, you no longer would be able to say, but I mean, we've been in a relationship for 10 years and you, you didn't seem to think that I was a rapist for any of those years, right? That doesn't matter anymore. That's, this is a new thing. And in an era where we're being told you have to get videotaped consent, oh no, even that's not enough. Or you have to get, you know, consent on an app, oh, that's not enough. 
and where we're always told that women must be believed, even though we know that there are some women who lie. In fact, lying about rape is much more common than lying about other felony crimes. Just a fact, in the statistics, about 10%. That means 90% of women who are sexually assaulted uh, are telling the truth. So 9 out of 10 women, based on the numbers, are telling the truth. And those scummy guys should be thrown in prison for a very, very long time. But there are going to be these other cases. There are going to be Kavanaugh's, my friends. And you will see now that this has changed the standard by which a man's actions can be judged by a jury such that he will have to, he will have to be able to, to, uh, to prove that every act, every time over a long period with a woman when there was a lot of consent, if there was one time where consent was in doubt, maybe he has to go to prison for a long time. That's a standard that we're going to go back and look at and say, how is this really workable in a criminal justice system in a way that's going to be fair? I just wanted to follow up on uh, my colleague's question about Russian interference. Can you pledge to the American people that you will not accept any foreign assistance in the upcoming election? And on this idea of a purge in your administration, uh, there was recently the departure of your acting DNI, Joseph McGuire. You replaced him with your ambassador to Germany, Rick Grinnell. Uh, some of your critics have uh, pointed out that Ambassador Grinnell has no intelligence experience. How can you justify to the American people having an acting DNI with no intelligence okay, experience? Okay, first of all, I want no help from any country, and I haven't been given help from any country. And if you see what CNN, your wonderful network, said, uh, I guess they apologized in a way for, didn't they apologize for the fact that they said certain things that weren't true? Tell me, what was their apology yesterday? What did they say? Mr. President, I think our record on delivering the truth is a lot better than yours sometimes, your if you don't mind is, me saying. Your, let me tell you about your record. Your record is so bad, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You have probably I'm the not worst ashamed record. of anything in our You probably have the worst record ashamed, in the history sir. of broadcasting. Love it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss this, man. I mean, whatever. I, I think we got four more years of it, hopefully, but thank God. I mean, Jim Acosta is a joke and a, and a, a, a complete and utter... Uh, mockery of what journalism is allegedly supp- uh, supposed to be. Um, but here you have the usual, you know, when did you stop beating your wife question from the media? Will you pledge now that you will not take foreign interference? Yeah, yeah of course he's not going to take foreign interference. It's such, it's such a, a dirty maneuver to even ask a president about this. Foreign interference wouldn't even help him. It's stupid. It's a dumb idea. I remember the president told me this himself. He's like, it doesn't even make any, when I was sitting in the Oval Office, the president said, it doesn't even make any sense. Well, what are we, we're going to do what? Oh, we're going to spread some memes on Facebook about Hillary and then possibly have all this, you know, think about all that's come from this special counsel and all this election stuff that's led nowhere because it was all based on lies. But imagine if it was based on the truth. So it's, it's not even a good plan, but the, the people that have pushed this are still fixated on it because otherwise they'd have to look in the mirror and realize they're a bunch of dopes, a bunch of idiots. And they've done a lot of damage to the country as a result of this. Um, the truth is that the likeliest place that you will see foreign interference, I'm sorry, interference, illicit interference in our election comes from inside the intelligence community itself. Inside the intelligence community, you will see um, people who leak information. That's the entire latest round of Russia collusion insanity resulted really almost direct, well, resulted directly from uh, a briefing given to members of Congress, a whole bunch of them, by the intelligence community in a way that if you were designing a meeting that you knew would have details that would leak, that's what it would be. Get a whole bunch of members of Congress together, put out the explosive allegation that Russia is still helping Trump. And then, oh, there were so many people in the room. I don't know who told the press because it's classified. It's illegal to leak that information to the press. But guess what? It leaked very quickly. There'll be more of this. You know, Marie Yovanovitch just got a seven-figure book deal. Yeah, that's right. She's got over a million dollars to write a book. The book's going to suck. No one's going to read it. It's going to be boring. That's not the point. It's a payoff for her being a good little soldier of the deep state against Trump. 
The left does this. They're far better at it than we are. We have, you know, we got a handful of conservative billionaires who love to write checks to like boring think tanks that don't really do anything. Uh, we need to start having outlets and, and platforms for people who are soldiers for conservatism. Where you can go, well, you'll, where uh, you'll be taken care of. We, you know, we need publishing imprints. We need these things. Because we're at a huge disadvantage in the information war against the left when they know that if you stand up against Trump and you get fired, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter how, as long as you were standing up against Trump, you're going to get a book deal, speaking circuit, board seat, all, all this great stuff. Because the left takes care of their soldiers. On the right, we're like, yeah, you know, go start a business, find a job. Sorry, your career's ruined. 